Six million ways to die. Choose one. <laughs> How am I try to do? Try to test me. You want to test the rocket launcher? Well, let me tell you something. You're the original butcher. We have the chopper. Now the mercy. Hear this. Wait, the man. Ooh, oh my goodness. Folks, good evening. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Thank you so much for making time to be with me here, to, you know, be a part of this one night stand that we're going to be having this evening. So, how do I start? Where do I start? I'll be the first person to say, not having done alive in so long i kind of felt very rusty extremely rusty when i was setting myself up back for things today so let me who to hail out yvonne rude trude Sha shakel or shaquille um batiste roxanne margaret empress c giselle ford angela madu Mary James, Daniela Williams, Niabo, Chris, Chrisel, sorry, Chrisel, um, Carla, McIntyre, Damian Scott, uh, Michelle D, 29, Super C, Taker, I think it's Taker, Taker George, Lisa Joe, Celestine Joseph, Lakeisha Prince, Andre Forgeny, Nicole Caesar, Marsha Marsh, Jasmine Spence, Jared Arundel, oh my goodness, Don Roberts, Daniel Frederick, Daniel Knights, Marva James, Sue Erickson, Marissa. Hi Marissa, how you doing? How the husband? Um Anne McCarthy. Hi Anne, how things out in um Toko? Um Barbara Ravello, Sheldon Jack, Janelle Speth. Janelle Speth, nice to see you. Winston John Jones, sorry, John Edwards, Debs Baker, D. Pear, Anna Sedano, Nadine Mapp, Jennifer Martindale. La, there's a long roll call, boy. Brian Patterson. I, I ain't feel like I call all the names. <laughs> Madam Moringa, Paula Barrymon, Jamelia. Olia, good evening. Thank you for joining me thank you for being here hey hi uncle ian 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 lee nice to see you anastasia christopher francois boy <laughs> real tough shutters in the house avril das <laughs> karen renee um michael pollard cynthia james jelani reed wow <laughs> wow is a real long Roll call here. Hi, Melka. Hi, Angela. Gemma, Veronica, Neil. So, yeah, um, it's nice to it's nice to visit because I don't want to say it's nice to be back because I'm not back back. So, let's clear a couple of things up. Like one time, I'm doing this one off one night stand live because this particular issue needs some clarifying the national security thing and then i also wanted to touch a little bit about what's going on with the unc and of course there are a couple other stories as well but what really made me decide okay yes i'm gonna put the studio back together boot things up make sure that i'm in a um, position to do this thing properly because I could have just pick up my phone and go live from my phone and talk to Ollie about it from my phone. But I felt, no, we needed to kind of touch things in a particular way. So we're here to touch on things in a particular way because I always feel that national security is a huge deal. It's a big issue because in various ways it impacts on everybody's life. So that's why I'm here just for tonight. Um, my intention has always been when I um, took the break from last year to come back like around the middle of this year. So when I do resume, I'm kind of aiming tentatively, tentatively, I am aiming for emancipation. When I say tentatively, what I mean is that's the goal I have in my head to resume like regular um, programming. And I'm still trying to figure out what I mean by regular programming. 
um, but the goal is to be back out from around August um, for one very important reason. If I come back out in, in August, August will be like roughly a year before general elections is due. And I feel like there's a lot that we need to talk about long before the general, general elections mode kicks in for the country. So I'm thinking around August, but it all depends on how I'm feeling and of course where my head is at, you know, where my head space is at. If I'm thinking it's not absolutely necessary, I might push it down um, even further. Hi Karina in Connecticut, Draymore, Nashon Cummings. <sighs> Good. So I'm here. I'm sure you all have questions, all you have questions. Oh, thanks Tisha. Um, yes, thank you for saying that. I think I've lost some weight. Starboy, we have to blame Starboy. Um, Starboy has me, <laughs> Starboy and Stella have me active every day. I can't miss a day. When I feel like I want to stay home and rest, Stella is like, no, you can't stay home and rest. So I'm pretty much out and about on a daily basis. I'm just scrolling through all of the messages here. From, Hi, Francilla. How you doing? Your daughter used to be messaging me. Oh, I should tell you all because people think I've disappeared, disappeared, disappeared entirely. No, I've been lurking around Instagram. So I've been posting pictures from time to time on Instagram. And when people are trying to find me to message me, they've been messaging me via Instagram. So if push come to shove and you absolutely need to find me, I guess you can find me on Instagram, but I haven't disappeared entirely. I kind of follow things um, loosely on Instagram because the new stories there from time to time. Okay, all right, let's get the show on the road because Ollie ain't necessarily here. Hey, Beach, how you doing? Hey, Clayton. Hey, Theresa. Right, Ollie ain't necessarily here to you know catch up on Starboy and Stella. We are here for other things. So. What are we going to start with? Let's start with the bad news and then we'll go into the good news. So, sorrows, sorrows, tears. The year started off, the year kicked off. Um, somebody said they thought I was in Ireland with the boss, yes? The boss ain't going to Ireland yet, you know? The boss still in Trinidad. How do I know this? Because Imbut is not yet acting prime minister. That's how I always know when the Prime Minister is out of the country, when Imbert becomes the acting Prime Minister. And since I ain't seen no notice saying that Imbert is the acting Prime Minister, the boss is still in the country. He probably in Tobago, um, lining up which goats he going and race tomorrow. Alright, so, just now, why is this thing not scrolling? Okay, right, good, it's scrolling. We kicked off January 1st with one of the most momentous passings in the country. Um, in the nation's history, certainly for the 21st century. So I wanted to formally say condolences to the family of Basdale Pandey. So Mr. Pandey used to be my MP. He was the MP for my seat. So the first way in which I know of him is as the MP for the seat that I grew up in. And then when I became a little bit older, I found out that my father used to do printing work for the union that he was uh, um, at the helm of and so he, he daddy would give me stories about his interactions with Pandy. One of the things about Pandy that you cannot deny at all is how charming and charismatic he was. Um, I would say some of his politics from 1995 come forward were problematic for me. Some of his governance choices were problematic for me but in general in total the things that I admired was his charisma and the sharpness of his mind the sharpness of his wit sharpness of his sense of humor and the constitutional reform is something that he has always ever been passionate about was always ever passionate about so I was glad to hear Michaela make the call to say the best way to honor him is via constitutional reform and I'm in agreement with that and I was happy to see 
that subsequent to his funeral, the current government put together a committee um, to begin the whole constitutional reform thing. So I know that there are consultations taking place now in different spaces because I saw an ad up until today um, saying that the, con the committee, the constitutional reform committee, was headed to Sandy Grandi. I have to check to see when they're coming in my area so that I can show up at the consultations. So I'm glad to see that um, the sitting government has taken that call seriously and that there is at least some um, thrust towards um, looking at discussing constitutional reform because I don't think that any constitution is perfect as is. I think that a constitution is a living, breathing document and it is a sort of document that needs to be evolved, which is why laws have to be amended um, every so often, which is why you make changes, adjustments, add clauses, take out clauses. But of course, it should always be done um, with a view to representing, representing positive change. Like when you're amending a constitution, it should be protecting citizens, not exposing citizens to... Um, not exposing citizens to abuse. <laughs> so you will hear the dogs. And you will hear the dogs because Starboy does not like being in a separate room from me. And <laughs> I left him out of the studio. He was not thrilled about that. So he will from time to time just begin to bark randomly as if there is something that I need to be concerned about so that I will come out of this study, right? His, um, his need to shepherd me and to be next to me all the time is um, intense and it's one of the things that I have to juggle all the time because I'm thinking when I do eventually resume doing regular lives, I have no idea how I'm going to be managing <laughs> the situation with the dogs because the dogs have become a total hand handful right so there was Pandey's death um so condolences to his family and his loved ones then there was right this direction <laughs> my boy i have very little to say sorrows sorrows tears then this one came as a shock to me and it came as a shock to me because I had seen Jumbo recently, right? Because I drive through St. James on a regular basis. And so, I mean, I'd noticed that I hadn't seen him on the street for a couple of days selling nuts where he no normally sells nuts. And then I see the news and I was like, oh, geez, and ages. So I'm sorry about this. Condolences to his family. And um, I'm hoping and hopeful that the Ministry of Sport does something to kind of commemorate the memories of these kind of folk heroes. I think future generations need to know Jumbo's story, even if it's just to have a picture of him up at um, either the Queen's Park Oval or the Hazley Crawford Stadium. I would, I personally would want to see it at the Oval because that's the first time I would have seen guys like Jumbo and Nuts Landing when I went to see cricket and they would be there entertaining the crowd, especially during breaks. They'd be entertaining the crowd while selling their product. And I feel we need to celebrate folk heroes like Jumbo as, as well as you know other persons that we see as large heroes i think they are just as deserving and just as large um so yeah i'm hoping that he gets celebrated him and other folk heroes um working class heroes i think you know i want to see that kind of celebration of them and us getting the opportunity to publicly pay tribute to their memory and what they add to culture here right then on the weekend this weekend we will have had the passing of one of our legal giants chief justice de la Bastide. um i just know him as a legal luminary 
you know, and when he decides to speak on an issue, whether it's a legal issue or a civil society issue, people stop and listen. I mean, I knew when he was chief justice, but I was pretty young when he was chief justice. So I was not paying that much attention to what the judiciary was doing. But I do have a copy of his autobiography that I've dipped into from time to time. Um, and so um, condolences to the family of um, Chief Justice de la Bastide. And of course, condolences to the legal fraternity because they have lost an icon and a giant. Ooh. Oh, I forgot to say Happy Easter. As a matter of fact, it's not just Easter. This is one of those weekends, and this is one of the things I like about Trinidad and Tobago, right? Yesterday, I was carrying the dogs to walk. But I was carrying them to walk, like, up in the east. And I'm driving past, like, so I was kind of out of it, right? Because I have not been paying attention. I knew it was the Easter weekend. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I knew it was the Easter weekend. I knew it was Spiritual Baptist Liberation Day on Saturday. But I didn't realize that this weekend was also Pagua or Holy. So I'm driving, heading east. And I see by Spring Village Hindu school there on the grounds in... Um, St. Augustine side, right? So like, just like, you know, just after K. Donna, those of you who remember that, who remember K. Donna, just after K. Donna on the highway heading east. So I'm seeing, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. It's Pagua. And I'm like, I don't know. Do we understand how special a place we have that it could be Easter weekend. It could be Passover. It could be the middle of Ramadan because Eid is coming up just now. So you have Easter, Passover, Ramadan, Spiritual Baptist Liberation Day, Pagwa. What am I missing? I'm, I'm sure I'm missing something else. Either which way, all of these things, all of these things taking place comfortably. Nobody at one another truth. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not the sort of person that assumes that here is a kumbaya place because I know that there are lots of tensions in Trinidad and Tobago. And lots of tensions. But I also look at the fact that in Trinidad and Tobago, we just figure out how to give people the space to do the thing. So, Baptists doing the thing, Roman Catholics doing the thing, some of the small churches who, who celebrate in Passover doing the thing, Hindus doing the thing. And, you know, there's a whole rich cultural experience going on here. I could easily participate in all of the things that are going on or none of the things that are going on. I could look on at the things that are going on and say, well, okay, nice, interesting, and keep it moving. I could decide to call friends and say, hey, let me go and check out Pagua. Or, hey, let me go and take in mass, you know, today, Easter. Tomorrow, we could go and take in whatever it is needs to be taken in for Easter Monday. But all of that to experience. And you ain't have to be at one another throat. You could just let people do the thing. You could coexist. And that is what happens when you have a multicultural society that is working its way forward. A multicultural society that is functioning under a constitution that allows for multiple religious groups, multiple ethnicities, and multiple opinions. And I'm coming back to this particular point. Um, I saw some persons pointing some things out and you're absolutely right. I forgot to say condolences to the family of um, the former head of the um, public service, um, Mr. Reginald Dumas. So forgive me for that. So condolences to his family and condolences to the family of Major Ralph Brown. Now, I was going to add the major's picture to the, to the lineup. And I decided against it because 
it would have make me talk about things that I ain't really want to get into <laughs> and start to talk about because I see Debbie done post it up because for me to talk about Ralph Brown I might end up talking about somebody else and I ain't really want to because I don't have to you know touch it in a way I had to touch it from an angle right I, I had to touch it from an angle so but condolences to the family of Major Ralph Brown and condolences to the family of the former head of the public sector, Reginald Dumas. Right, I think I have covered what I want to discuss with sorrows, sorrows, tears. Let me move on. So, I don't think it's a secret that I do consultancy work for the Ministry of Finance, right? And so the government has moved forward with the property tax. And as a result of the government moving forward with the property tax, again, the opposition and people who have an interest in not paying property tax have started up their campaign. And I've had people reaching out to me to say to me, well, there needs to be a property tax campaign. And I've asked on occasion, when you say there needs to be a property tax campaign, what exactly are you saying you don't understand about property tax that you want to understand about property tax? Explain to me when you say you want a property tax campaign, what is it that you're not grasping about the tax? because I will say this property tax has been an issue a political issue being kicked about the place since 2009 I remember when Karen Nunes Teixeira was then the Minister of Finance under the Patrick Manning government and Prakash Ramadar and a couple other people from the Congress of the people decided that they were going to make property tax into their campaign for vaulting the Congress of the people into the public eye again because they had the last time they'd been significant had been the 2007 elections right so they ran the 2007 elections they would have gotten a little over a hundred thousand votes I've forgotten how many how many votes it might be maybe about a hundred and forty to hundred and fifty thousand votes it actually might be a little bit more than that so I could be wrong about them figures. Let me pause on the figures. Either which way, the Congress of the People got a significant portion of the votes in the 2007 election, but they didn't win a seat. And because they got a significant portion of the votes in 2007, they cut into votes that would traditionally go to the United National Congress the United National Congress therefore lost seats that they would have had prior to 2007. Okay, so Anthony Morgan Beach says 147,000. So I wasn't off when I was thinking 150,000 votes. So in 2007, the Congress of the People got 147,000 votes. And that 147,000 votes undermine the UNC's um, vote count right and so as a result of that in 2007 people felt they were forced to be reckoned with but because they didn't win any, se win any seats they kind of you know their their importance kind of waned so by 2009 property tax became the issue that they used to vault themselves into the public domain between 2009 to now there have been several occasions when the return of property tax because it's been suspended since 2009 we haven't paid property tax since 2009 and essentially not having paid property tax since 2009 to now means that annually the Treasury has a shortfall of about four billion dollars a year so 2007 sorry 2009 to now is actually it'd be easier for me to come from 2010 2010 to 2020 
would be 10 years and then to 24 would be four years and then so 15 years it's been 15 years since we have collected property tax and property tax if I've calculated calculated it correctly can bring in about four billion dollars in revenue annually so 15 by 4 that's 60 billion dollars between 2009 to now the state has not collected about 60 billion six zero billion dollars in revenue we have as a country been paying property tax for about 89 years or rather property property tax has been in existence here in Trinidad and Tobago for about 89 years yet every time there is conversation about the return of property tax there is but we never had that before even though all of you know all your parents and grandparents was paying land and building tax then the most recent thing I'm hearing is that property tax and stamp tax is the same thing and property tax and stamp tax um, would be double taxing. Stamp duty is a one-off payment, right? Stamp duty is a one-off payment and you pay stamp duty on a range of things, not just when you're purchasing a property. So when you're purchasing a property, it's a one-off payment that you make and that's a one-off payment because you have to register the documents and you're basically paying to register the documents so that's what stamp duty is for property tax is an annual payment on your property and the way in which the legislation has been amended the money is no longer going into the central fund it is now going into the various local government corporations and it is meant to be going directly into upgrading all of the goods and services and amenities in your communities so it therefore means that property tax is a tax that you are paying to ensure that the services that you are currently receiving and even improved services supposed to take place now I'm not going to pretend that there haven't been um, frustrations with the whole release releasing of documents because valuations division has had hiccups and problems BIR has had hiccups and problems so there are people who have received their tax notice and then receive the valuation uh, their property valuation from valuations division so in those instances those things need to be fixed but when somebody actually when several people want to be running to my inbox and these days I real quick to block people from any of my inboxes if you look into come and disturb my peace so you are running to my inbox to say there needs to be a property tax campaign and I want to understand a campaign for what to tell you you need to pay a property tax that's what you need a campaign for to tell you that you need to pay the property tax help me to, to understand <laughs> help me to help help me to help myself anybody does need to tell you to like launch a campaign to tell you you need to pay that anybody does need to launch a campaign to tell you you need to pay health to charge anybody does need to launch a campaign to tell you you need to pay NIS If a campaign was launched to tell you pay health surcharge all of the people right now who don't pay health surcharge but is be lined up in the hospital when the day come or they think they're going to pay health health surcharge because an ad campaign tell them they had to pay health surcharge all of the people right now who not paying income tax and I'm not talking about small people eh? I'm talking about all the lawyers and doctors who just be collecting money in cash right everybody who doing pro all the professionals who have their small business and their side business and their side hustle and they collecting money in cash 
and not declaring income if we launch a campaign to say all of this income that you are collecting on the side that you are not declaring you should pay your income tax you think that's going to get anybody to go out and pay the income tax well you need to give me a shitting chance right so rest me with this we need a property tax campaign nobody ever wants to pay a tax nobody wants to be told they have to pay a tax as a matter of fact all of the noise about the tax right now is to find ways to justify not paying the tax and what if i told you that the ways to not pay the tax linked to national security issues what if i said to you that we have people here who making money that they don't want the government to know about whether it is legal or illegal because you have all kind of people big business and small business right big business and small business where people are making more than $8,400 a month. Because you do know that if you are making $8,400 a month or less, you don't have to pay income tax. You only have to pay NIS and health surcharge. So anybody who income is more than $8,400, when the month come, supposed to be paying PAYE, right? Income tax. We have small businesses, medium businesses large businesses don't want to pay income tax we have people who have side hustle all kind of side hustle they don't want to pay income tax we have people who are making who are earning money off real estate right so you have place to rent you have and you're renting place out so you're making additional income because you are renting your property owner and you're renting and 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 whatever else you're doing with the property not paying in uh, they're not declaring the additional income not declaring additional income but all they want me to hot up my head about when you need to say something about property tax i don't need to say one ass trinidadians don't like to pay tax trinidadians love to avoid tax and so we have people here who are currently in a position where for the last 15 years they would have bought a lot of they would have bought a lot of um they would have bought a lot of property i'm seeing a question here is it 8400 a month or 84000 a year it might be 7000 a month might be but i think it i think the figure has gone up because it was it was six thousand then it was raised to seven thousand and i believe there was another adjustment to um to the income tax allowance so it might be as much as eight thousand four hundred dollars a month i'm subject to, to 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 um to correction anyhow back to the the point that i wanted to make there are a lot of people who have bought properties in the last 15 years. They bought a lot of properties in the last 15 years. But nobody knows that they own all of the properties that they own because we've not been paying property tax. So you don't have to you don't have to you don't have to declare the properties that you have because you're not paying property tax. BIR doesn't know anything about these properties. And one of the important ways to wash money is through properties. So if you have money that you haven't declared, it could be legally, um, it, could, it could be money earned legally, it could be money earned illegally. But one of the ways to hide the money or to change up how the money looking is through property, through real estate. So you are there buying real estate. You don't have to pay property tax on real estate. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what is going on at all. And because nobody knows what is going on now that property tax is kicking in and people are being valuated and they're getting devaluations and they're going to have to pay taxes 
it means that the state becomes aware of how many properties people own. Now, if you have properties, multiple properties, but the income that you are declaring, the income you're claiming they're making, right? The income you're saying you're making can't possibly have paid for those properties. Then you need to explain things to Border Inland Revenue. And there are a lot of people who don't want to explain a damn thing to the Board of Inland Revenue. Yeah? So, no. Me I feel I need to tell none of you all you had to pay tax. And I don't feel in this day and age, I still have to be explaining to people the difference between stamp duty and a tax. Because all of you who is property owners, all you're big and all you have sense. All you know what a stamp duty is and all you know what property tax is and what property tax is supposed to be doing. When anybody could come and explain to me where and how we making up the four billion dollars a year in lost revenue from collecting the tax then we could start to have a conversation until then anybody who are afraid to pay a tax probably afraid to explain their wealth right so that's that i feel i've covered that right what we need to go on to right is that the correct picture i didn't add my boy picture who was that one boy just now eh? let me close that there's a picture that i was supposed to have here let me find it ah found it So all kind of bacchanal taking place inside the UNC. And I've been paying attention to the bacchanal as much as I could pay attention to the bacchanal. Kamala Prasad Visesa is being challenged for leadership of the UNC. Since 2023, when they had, when we had the local government election, I kept telling you all, pay attention to what is going on inside the United National Congress. If there is to be a change in government, in 2025 that change in government will only happen if there is a change up inside the united national congress because as it stands kamala is unpalatable she's she's a spent force so she is basically holding on to the leadership position the unc understands this and by when i said the unc there are a lot of people in the I don't want to say the leadership levels, but certainly the management level of the UNC, they understand that if a change doesn't happen inside of the party and doesn't happen soon, then they don't really stand a chance in the 2025 election. And by stand a chance, I'm not necessarily talking about win, win or lose yet. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, if they are to be a viable force in a general election, they have to make a change internally. So up steps Rushton Parry. And I believe that Rushton is one of the, he's actually the only person I could think of that has a legitimate um, chance to become the next political leader of the United National Congress. I know Rudal Munilal wanted to be. I know for quite some time that that was his, you know, that was what his eyes were on. But I don't think Rudal Munilal has the, I don't think he has the currency to become the political leader of the United National Congress. There's a meeting that I was paying attention to. Let me see if I could find. Let me see if I could find that. Right. Oh, who I forget to download this video. Tech guy must you want to cut my tail. You can't cut my tail, tech guy. Sorry. Sucks to be you. Ah, good. Yes, no. Good. I have it here. We in our gear. Okay. So let's go. What happened there? 
Why? And the wider meters right. in case may be. So this is a statement for the minutes 13th March 2024 of the Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha on matters surrounding the Ramaitri's Hindu school. We, the executive of the Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha, believe that there is a need to clarify certain matters for the record and also for the benefit of the public, especially the parents and children of the school and other stakeholders at large who maintain an interest in the welfare of this school. Frankly, we did not deem it necessary to say anything before. And before this time, as our focus and thrust had always been the speedy reopening of the school and to minimize the downtime for the students already disadvantaged with delays and inconvenience. However, we have seen certain media reporting carried on TV6 Evening News and in the express print newspapers on or about the 20th or the 21st of February 2024, as well as statements recycled on social media sites including the official page of Dr. Rudal Munilal, Member of Parliament for Oropuch East. We believe that these now warrant a response. It would be erroneous to construe our response this afternoon as an attack on anyone or any entity since our focus continues to be stating the facts as they are and for the betterment and education of our children. Ladies and gentlemen, on Saturday, 17th February 2024, we witnessed one of the darkest days in our country's history when we had some, Baba, if I may say, rakshas, or should I say for the general public, hooligans attempting to derail our religious ceremony at Ramai Trace Hindu School. Thankfully, they did not succeed, but their actions did in fact desecrate our religious place of worship. The Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha's position with respect to same has already been articulated on the 19th of February 2024 on our executive or our executive's TV Jagati Forum, Jagaran the Awakening. So I leave that there. Following this unfortunate incident on the 17th of February 2024, I advised our Dharmacharya, Secretary General and President General that a report should be made to the police for the assault upon them as well as the verbal desecration and disturbance of our religious place of worship. On that night, the Dharmacharya the Secretary General and the President General made it clear and they made an appeal for calm and extended an open invitation to anyone wishing to air any grievances whatsoever. They were prepared to host civil discussions with any apparently disaffected group. To that end, they desisted from getting the police involved. To date, not a single person has written a letter of the alphabet, a, an email, a correspondence, WhatsApp, snail mail, telegram, or anything whatsoever to raise any issue surrounding the naming of the Ramaitris Hindu school. So... Now, <laughs> boy, where to start, boy? This is the Pundit Parashad here, right? Because that's what, that's what this meeting is and the Secretary General of the Mahasabha would have allowed MP Dinesh Rambali to chair this part of the proceedings and of course to clear up a couple things on their minutes. The Mahasabha is clearly leading the charge against the United National Congress. And we all understand the importance of the Mahasabha in being able to bring a particular level of the religious vote, right? It's a, it's a voting block, right? The religious vote into um, the 
into the, 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 the political struggle within the United National Congress. So, what is clear to me and what has been clear to me since 2023, Kamala does not have the support of the Mahasabha. Now, the Mahasabha is not the only Hindu religious organization here. There are a number of other Hindu religious organizations, and I would imagine that she is probably trying to cozy up to them. But the Mahasabha, I think, has the largest numbers and the biggest sway. So here you have the Mahasabha in a situation where it is clearly at war with the leadership of the United National Congress. So I saw that and I said to myself, that explains why my girl all up in Christian evangelical business since last year. You all remember the local government campaign and the fact that the local government campaign for the United National Congress quickly came across, quickly became like a revivalist meeting. So every single night you're looking at um, UNC political meetings for the local government elections campaign in 2023. And you would be forgiven for thinking that you're attending a crusade because it's him, is Kamala reading from Bible, is Kamala quoting Bible. Now I understand. Now I understand only too well because she has lost the support of a huge part of the Hindu vote. Kamala has now decided that she has become an evangelical Christian. And she's not just an evangelical Christian, she's also seeking to tap into, or to continue to tap into whatever um, clout she has within the spiritual Baptist community. But I want to get back to, I want to get back to this guy. Where do I want to start with this? Rushton has recently come out in like within the last month or so to talk about um, the need for um, Kamala to call on internal elections. And I agree with that. If a political party can't honor its promise to its voter base, it's not gonna honor its promises to the wider nation. And so if it can't respect the constitution of its party and the arrangements of its party, I'm not expecting that it will respect the constitution of the country. So for me, Kamala's inability to call on internal elections and to honor the structures of her party makes her null and void as a leader for the wider nation. But one of the things that I think Rushton needs to focus on is calling out the problems within his party. In putting himself forward as a prospective leader for the people for the United National Congress, one of the things he did was to position the United National Congress as being the same as the People's National Movement. I don't feel as a way to go. I don't feel the best angle to go with is that both parties are the same. If only because there's a lot within the United National Congress that needs cleaning up. You have MPs that you, Mr. Parry, have sat next to for several years now who have questions to answer in court, whose names are linked to police investigations, who have all kinds of legal matters hanging over their heads. You have Arnold Roberts, Roberts sorry, sitting in the Senate on behalf of your party who has done a number of vile things and is associated with the life sports scandal. You have Julian John, another person who has had questions to answer about her dealings with HDC. You have David Nakid, who is often quite vile in the Senate and on social media in terms of the comments that are made. And then, don't get me started 
about the MPs that you are sitting next to. There is the MP for Kuba North, whose name has often been called in questionable issues. There is David Lee, who has questions to answer for what more than a million dollars in motor vehicle tax exemptions and everybody asked him well who exactly was that vehicle that he got the exemptions on bought for there is um barry padara who has questions to answer about monies received when he was um an assistant to Kamala Pasabi Sessa even though he says he's our only child and his mother was giving him the money he still has questions to answer where that is concerned um I mean there are long list of persons in the United National Congress that you should be challenging that you should be raising questions about because your party can't go forward with those persons can't simply can't go forward with those persons so i don't feel that the way to tackle your campaign is necessarily to be attacking the people's national movement i feel between now and whenever an internal elections is called for the unc what you need to be focused on is ensuring that your potential voter base understands the kind of revamping and restructuring that you need to do inside of the United National Congress. And I say this because back in 2010, when there was that, that huge loss for the People's National Movement, after the loss, PNM supporters were very, very, very depressed, or a word we like to use in Central, down press, right? PNM supporters was real down press and everybody was like, well, how are we going to come back from this? And I remember Dr. Rowley holding a meeting in Enterprise at the basketball court. I remember the meeting because my mother wanted to go to the meeting and she called me and asked me if I would take her down to the meeting. And we drove, I left where I was living at that point in time, went to Central and drove her to the meeting in Enterprise. Me, I personally wasn't particularly invested in attending the meeting but my mother wanted to attend the meeting because at that point in time i was more in i was more in favor of the congress of the people so i went down to the meeting and i listened to everything dr rowley said in that meeting because he walked into a room of voters that were hurting right because it was 2912 the licks was bad it was real bad licks shogunas east at that point in time had gone over to stephen kd's he was now the mp and people were very 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 upset about what had happened in the elections and i'm sitting in the meeting and dr Rowley says to the audience and to this day i am not sure that the audience understood all of the things he was saying because they wanted to hear somebody come and tell them it was going to be better that's not what dr rowley did in that meeting he came and he said to them i know all you're hurting and for us to get back to where we were there is a lot of work we have to be that has to be done to change this party that is what he came and he talked about he didn't talk about don't worry, we gain back in power. And there was no empty promises. There was no wild chair leading. There was no stupid euphor euphoria. It was a very sober, very sober, very pragmatic, very frank conversation he had with his audience that day. People were hurting and Dr. Rowley was telling them all you had to hurt more before we could get to where we need to get to. And from 2010 to 2015, it was a rough road inside the PNM. The, the political leader in 2013 for the general election, actually before the general elections of 2013, 
when 2012 came around and your political party do their foolishness with section 34 right when they do their simi dimi to be able to let off ish and steve and whoever else with our piece of legislation one of the first things the pnm did was to kick off a public education campaign and from 2012 to now from 2012 to now the pnm has kept consistent with a public education campaign to ensure that its supporters understand the things that are taking place in terms of government policy not everybody does still listen not everybody does still tune in not everybody does still pay attention but i can tell you from 2012 to 2015 there was a change in terms of how the pnm began to conduct its affairs with respect to educating its support base the unc doesn't do that the unc has never in my recollection made an effort to have those kinds of cottage meetings where they are examining themselves as a party examining where they fit into the national landscape examining how they are meant to contend with all of the other groups and political parties here one of the first things dr rowley said to people in that enterprise meeting was that we in the pnm have to become appealing to more than just our base that was one of the first things he said and one of the first things he did was to ban the Balize tie. And he get licks for it. Enough licks for it. The other thing he did was to amend the party's logo and a lot of the party branding. And then to change up the way in which the party would have been perceived. You had to do some hard work rushed on. You can't just jump out and decide the PNM and the UNC is the same thing. Because there are people around, like myself, not just myself, plenty other people who could turn around and tell you precisely why the PNM and the UNC not the same thing. You could sit down and put a PNM meeting, political meeting, right next to a UNC political meeting and chalk and cheese. You could see the chalk and cheese. So much so, we have noticed that the conversations with the PN, the conversations with the Prime Minister format is now being copied openly by the United National Congress so that it could come across as a more serious entity. So, I will say this, Russia. When people ask me who I think could lead the UNC, your name was one of the first names I called. I said to people, point blank, Rudal Munilal cannot lead the UNC out of a paper bag more or less far less into the parliament as as a governing party right he doesn't have it he just does not have it kamala Passard bisessa doesn't have it either anymore there is no way not not as the unc alone not as a coalition she can't get back into power you have that potential but you have to be prepared to put in the work further to that your voter base had to be prepared to put in the work and until and unless they are prepared to put in the work i ain't seeing it all right so that's my two cents on what is going on with earlier inside the unc but right now i see in the struggle i see in the warfare i see in that kamala have a death grip on the party and if the um the support base of the unc does not force kamala's hand to have an internal elections that will be it for the United National Congress. I could show up by Mosquito Creek and rest a wreath down on Olya. Right, so I could log off on Rushton for a minute day and I could log off on Kamla. Right, I feel this Olya come here for. Whoops. 
You mean I didn't make that big? I was really beginning on it, me boy. Oh, what's the thing about tech guy artwork? So there's a thing I want all to watch with this artwork. Watch the eye. Watch the eye. Or let's see the jackass inside the eye. <laughs> you know, tech guy and easy, you know. Tech guy and easy. So, in thinking about how to do the live, like how to title the live and everything, I was like, okay, maybe um, we'll go with spy versus spy. So at first I was thinking of a spy versus spy, spy concept. Then I remembered that there's this movie because i read the book as well this is a movie from back in the day like in 1960s some somewhere thereabouts called the day of the jackal right jackal and i was like oh yes oh yes we're gonna go with the day of the jackal but it won't just be jackal it would be jackass why because there's a pack of effing jackass we dealing up with inside here in national security so i have to try to keep my temper in check for this part of the live because there's so much foolishness that going on with the SSA right so much foolish foolishness and there was so much foolishness with how this story was being covered I said to myself that's a wake up you know I say you know what time to stretch and say something so let's go let me see how we tackle in this. I'm not even sure how I'm starting this. Because every time I pause and I think about it, there's a different way I want to tackle it. But let's see. In any organization that is meant to be handling security, any organization that is meant to be handling security, your security um, plans, your security thrust, the things that you are planning to do, the stuff that you want to execute in national security will only be as effective as your intelligence. If you're fighting crime, you will only be able to effectively fight crime if your intelligence gathering is effective i want to say that again intelligence is critical to crime fighting if you want to fight crime in an organization or in a country your ability to fight crime will only be as effective as your intelligence gathering. Your ability to fight crime will only be as effective as your intelligence gathering. I want Olya to remember that when Olya in all your little WhatsApp groups sending video back and forth to one another about the various crimes that are taking place in the country and when all you on social media reading the various crime stories and commenting on the comment thread i want you all to remember that a country's ability to fight crime is only as effective as the intelligence it gathers so let me get into it hmm. so on or around the first of march i got a press release the rest of you would have gotten a press release as well i shared the press release is one of the few things in terms of politics and national news that I would have shared in a while, right? And it would have been the press release from the office of the Prime Minister that indicated that there was going to be a change up with the head of the SSA, that they were getting rid of the current head of the SSA and they were going to be changing to um, 
they were going to they were going to have an interim head to the SSC. I'm just looking for a particular link. Right. The link is coming up. I'll switch screens just now. So, do I want to go with this story? I ain't sure if I want to go with this story first. Mm. I'm still trying to figure out where to start, where, what, what angle to start with this thing from, you know. So, the first story I would have seen would have been a story from Anna Ramdas. And I've got, yeah, I've got that image here. Now, a couple of weeks ago, the Express lost a case against Colman Boot. And that case was important. It was a landmark ruling that would have come out from the judiciary. The judge on the matter was Justice Ricky Rahim. Let me tell you why the case was important. Back in 2016, November 2016 to be specific, The Express printed a bold Sunday headline story that said that Minister Imbut, as Minister of Finance, basically used his power as Minister of Finance to instruct the HDC to pay his wife over $7.5 million dollars big front page story so if it on the front page you know the next page is going to be on his page three and the front page would have had a picture of Imbert and his wife so that everybody would have known who his wife was and then on page three it was a lead story written by Renuka Singh and the editor-in-chief would have been Omati Lida. in the matter a couple of weeks ago Justice Rahim established in his ruling that the entire story was fake. And I want you all to understand what I mean when I say fake. The headline was fake, and the story, the full story that would have been on, splashed across page three and the front page was fake. There was no evidence to establish that a check had ever been cut, that any money from the HDC um, any, well, 7.5 million from the HCC had gone to the wife. There was nothing to indicate that Minister Imbert in any form or fashion could influence the HDC to make the payment simply because those payments don't fall under his remit. Plain and simple. It is not a payment that the Ministry of Finance could issue. He couldn't send instructions to a PS for a PS, nothing like that. The whole story, Renuka Singh produced no evidence. Even though in her cross-examination, she talked about emails and phone calls and documents that she would have gotten via email. She produced no email threads. She produced no documents. She produced no phone records that established that she had spoken to anybody from HDC, anybody from the Ministry of Finance. Nothing, nothing, nothing not a shred of evidence as a matter of fact the hdc the let me see the the story came out this sunday the monday the hdc would have issued a statement to say well this is not the case the only check that we've ever issued to the wife of the minister was a check for about a hundred thousand dollars right but no outstanding no other outstanding invoices have been honored so a whole story with no supporting evidence, no supporting information. And it is on the front page and on page three as a lead investigative story. Now, when I see things like that, I just run to the shop and buy a pound of salt and say to myself, let me sit down with this salt so that the next time I see stories from the Express and from certain reporters I go pinch myself and take some salt and swallow, swallow the salt while I read in the story so I see the story from Anna Ramdas 
So this is what I was told. I was told that a former senior national security person in this country, when the press release was issued by the office of the prime minister, that person immediately made contact with reporters to say, I could link all you up with an interview with somebody who um, affected by the shakeup in the SSA. So this lead, so this senior national, former national security person attempts to link up um, interviews between the express and um, the person. I'm told that when the first express story was written about this entire SSA issue, the lawyers at the express say, we can't publish this story because it's too much hearsay and it go land the express in problems. That's to tell you how bad the story was. So I want you all to look at something here. I want us to start to piece things together properly. In this story written by Anna Ramdas about Pastor Brown, she says, he said he had provided intelligence to the special anti-crime unit sought under Brigadier Peter Joseph. Sought was not in existence in 2021. I want to make that clear. Sought was not in existence in 2021. And under the tenure of former police commissioner Gary Griffith, he was brought into the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service as an SRP. So if you only came into the police service in 2021 under Griffith as an SRP, in what capacity would you have been um, providing intelligence to the former brigadier? In what capacity? And the interesting thing is, he never provides any information that shows that he has any link to the TTPS or the SSA prior to 2021, right? Then look at the next paragraph, the paragraph that I have circled off there because I want all you to check that out properly. Ask if he ever provided secret and confidential inf information to Griffith after he exited as police commissioner. Brown said he never did. Brown yesterday shared his TTPS identification with the Express, which showed his regimental number and issue date of the year 2021. So I want to ask only this. Anna Ramdas, because it's an Anna Ramdas story. Anna Ramdas is writing an alleged investigative piece on this whole SSA issue. Why, in questioning Pastor Brown, Anna Ramdas only asks about whether he passed information on to Griffith. Because based on this story from Anna Ramdas, Pastor Brown has indicated that he worked in the SSA, or rather under sort, since Brigadier Peter Joseph. And he worked under um, police, um, police commissioners prior to Gary Griffith. So why? In that entire story about Pastor Brown, the spy master, the ghost who walks, right? In that entire story, you don't ask if he ever passed on information to Brigadier Joseph after Brigadier Joseph left sort. You don't ask if he passed on information to James Filbert after James Filbert stopped being the commissioner of police. You don't ask him if he worked under, um, oh God, Dwayne Gibbs, and if he continued passing on information to Dwayne Gibbs, you don't ask him if he ever passed on information to Stephen Williams. You don't ask him if he ever passed, continued to pass on information to McDonald Jacob. You only clarify, seek to clarify in the story that he never passed on information to Gary Griffith, right? So basically, in this story, and this story would have been early, early March, not too long after the Prime Minister sent out the press release. Clearly in this story, a move is made to establish that there is no connection whatsoever between Gary Griffith and Pastor Brown. 
So this is a 2024 story that is establishing that there is no connection between Gary Griffith and Pastor Brown as Commissioner of Police and former Commissioner of Police. So let's look at the fact that there is no relationship between Griffith and Pastor Brown. When, okay, I, I, I love history, like I said before, but when you look at it all and you begin to realize that you have Gary, Gary, do you, do you believe that this nation could really Let me see if this is the one. Like I said before. But when you look at it all and you begin to... Mm -mm. Gary, Gary, do you... You have a nice way of saying things like this, yeah? Why is this? The so former commissioner, uh, right. Mr. This Gary Griffith. He is a tremendous gentleman. I was telling Pro that this man gave his life to the Lord earlier this year. His son did it last year, and he was so inspired and challenged by the change in his son's life. And the bottom line is that his aunt is Pastor Katian Samaru. She is um, she and his mother are sisters, really. And the bottom line is that she has been a great influence to him over his. Over his I want to start this over. Right. So, and I want to make something clear. Based on the Anna Ramda story that you would have seen, that excerpt from the story, you would be forgiven for thinking, based on that story, that Pastor Brown only knew Mr. Griffith in a tangential way and from 2021 to now because remember um griffith stopped being gary griffith our brother in christ stopped being commissioner of police at the end of 2020 20, 2021 so because in that story the excerpt says he's never passed on any information you would be forgiven for thinking that he doesn't know gary he's never he hasn't interacted with gary since so let's go. Former Commissioner, um, Mr. Gary Griffith, he is a tremendous gentleman. I was telling Pro that this man gave his life to the Lord earlier this year. His son did it last year, and he was so inspired and challenged by the change in his son's life. And the bottom line is that his aunt is Pastor Katian Samaru. She is, um, she and his mother are sisters, really. And the bottom line is that she has been a great influence to him over his, over his life for years. As a matter of fact, um, the previous commissioner got a prophetic word concerning his life in the future that really made him think twice as to what he should do with his life. Thus far, we're 48 seconds in, not even a whole minute. 48 seconds in and we know that gary is a member of the pastor's church gary's son is also a member of the pastor's church gary was baptized into the church and gary our brother in christ has received a prophetic word from pastor brown the same pastor brown that he was clearly being distanced from in that anaranda story let's continue life at at this point in time in this season of his of his sojourn so to speak and as a newborn in christ you know i, t I told pro I, I am the one mentoring him that's a joke because um at the end of the day 
this gentleman loves to hold his head up high and let people know that um, he bows to no one but God. He believes in truth. He loves truth. And for whatever is God's will for his life, he's all for it. He's locked into a prophetic word that he got while he was at Sister Katya and Samru's. Um, did I pronounce that name right, Pro? Katya and Samru, right? Yes, 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 yes. Right, good. That's making sure I'm not um, um, saying the wrong thing. But the bottom line is that um, he's locked into his future right now. That's the point. That's the point. It took a while for him to decide if he should go this direction or not as far as um, um, making his life the life that God wants it to be. And that's the only way I could describe it, bro. Meaning that um, I've been around him while he was still commissioner. And after he was commissioner, to encourage him the Lord, um, knowing when he actually got baptized as well. But to deal with a Christian perspective of nation building is a challenge. Ole here, the pastor, say that he has been mentoring Gary, right? So imagine you're reading this story from Anna Ramdas in 2024. And in that story that comes out quickly on the heels of the prime minister having issued a statement saying that there is a shakeup at the SSA. Major Best has been sent on administrative leave. Things have to be changed at the SSA. There's no mention of anybody from the police service in that press release, right? The press release basically just talks about there being a shakeup. Um, there's an interim director, etc., etc., etc. Anna immediately comes out, not too long after that release, days within the release, whether it's 24 to 48 hours of the release, with a story from this spy master. And the spy master, in his recounting of things, takes great pains to distance himself from the former commissioner of police. You have to ask yourself, well, why? Why is there a need in that story to take such pains to distance yourself from the person who, based on the information in the public domain, was the person responsible for making you an SRP and is clearly a member of your church. I didn't have to go to the SSA to get this recording. I didn't have to intercept nobody YouTube channel to get this recording. The recording was sitting on there. As a matter of fact, two whole interviews on Isaac 98.1 FM YouTube channel with that features the pastor and the former commissioner. So why was it necessary to distance yourself from your brother in Christ? I mean, what kind of Peter on the night of the Last Supper behavior is that? How are you going to be denying the man in, in an express story, but it have video all over YouTube where the two of you in interviewing one another and you it basically saying, I'm mentoring this man. Why? Why would you deny your brother in Christ? I know for the Christian community, because we as the church generally, as you very well know, we don't like politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I could dare say, we don't like politicians either. Pro, you know me to my, my plain talking, you know, so <laughs> expect plenty of that. Um, so this was on the NTA page. I also need to make that. Thank you for reminding me of that beach. NTA page because I went to the NTA page to find this so it's not even a situation where Gary is unaware because this is his political party's page so there are a couple other clips I want Ole to listen to and I want Ole to listen to these clips because of the religious message in the clips right because they're bringing a word for us they're sharing a word and I want all of us present here tonight to listen to the gospel that these men sharing, right? I want the church to say amen, right? When we listen to what our brothers in Christ are discussing. Right. Gary, Gary, 
do you do you believe that this nation could really be run using um christian principles biblical christian principles do you really believe that this this country i'm talking about trinidad and tobago no because you're trinidadian and you you know what is going on you're involved in politics and you're involved um you know also at the level of of um national security and that sort of thing do you really believe that that can happen yeah, Professor, definitely. It must happen. There's, it, it is not an option. It is not the I'm going to play that again for you all because I want all of you to listen to the question that was asked and I want you all to then listen to Gary's response and then we're going to come back for me to discuss the importance of the question and the response. Gary, Gary, do you do you believe that this nation could really be run using um, Christian principles, biblical Christian principles? Do you really believe that this this country? I'm talking about Trinidad and Tobago. No, because you're Trinidadian and you you know what is going on. You're involved in politics and you're involved, um, you know, also at the level of of um, national security and that sort of thing. Do you really believe that that can happen? Yeah, Professor, definitely. It must happen. There's, it, it is not an option. It is not the... We live in a theocracy. Are we living in a theocracy? Or you hear that question from the person who moderated the program and then you hear the response? We live in a multi-religious, multicultural society that is governed under a constitution. And based on the wording in the constitution, there is supposed to be a separation between church and state. So we live in a society under a constitution where we are meant to obey the rule of law, not a religious rule. So when you start asking in an interview do you think we can be ruled according to christian rules in this country what you leave in for everybody else what are you leaving for people who are not christian further what are you leaving for people who might be christian but don't agree with your version of christianity and this was an interview, a normal, normal conversation on Isaac Radio 98.1 FM. The role of Christianity in politics, not how do we educate Christians and our Christian base to be better participants in their democracy. That's not what the conversation was about. The conversation was about whether or not Christians could run a country. Let's continue because there is more. Let the church say amen because our brother in Christ was on the mic. It's oh, a nice of you saying things like this, yeah? But like it or not, you will be a politician. Once you're born again Christian and you're full of the Holy Ghost and you're going to be serving Christ and taking up when Christ comes up for his people, the bottom line is simple. You shall reign with him. And the people, according to Daniel 7, shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom that has been given to them. So the kingdom of this world shall become of the kingdom of all world and of its Christ. And if God is going to give us some practice before that time, well, well, the church should say amen. I know, I know some churches. Have a nice way of saying things like this, yeah? But like it or not, you will be a politician. Once you're born again Christian and you're full of the Holy Ghost and you're going to be serving Christ and taking up when Christ comes up for his people, the bottom line is simple. You shall reign with him. And the people, according to Daniel 7, shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom that is... What does he mean by the people shall 
take the kingdom and possess the kingdom and if God help them let's go to let's go to another another reading right another reading Christian shouldn't get involved in politics at all, boy. How is it that you want to bring this together? Pastor Brown, talk to me. Okay, you muted us? So, all right, okay. Okay, so we're off now. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I'm a firm believer in the scriptures. I love the word. I love the fact that a lot of what is prophesied in the Old Testament that is to be fulfilled in the new is really before us right now. It's really in our face. And one of the things I could tell you, um, and once um, Pastor Margaret Lee, am I, am I correct now? Yeah, is on the air. She'll, she'll verify, and you being a doctor in theology, you know that in Acts 15, it talks about God building the tabernacle of David and rebuilding it as it was in the days of old to confirm the fact that there's going to be a governmental structure in the earth where Gentiles reign and rule with the same kind of a grace and authority and wisdom that David had, and not simply to reign and rule, but to ensure that what God does with the church just before the rapture is that the church goes out, not limping, but with a bang. In other words, we are really going to be the head and not the tail. Now that is going to happen. That is not going to happen in every nation, mainly because God respects our will, Professor. Mm -hmm. And some people will choose to want to honor God by giving themselves to God to fulfill certain things, and some wouldn't do it. And God will work with that. Right. And now I want to come to the final clip that I plan to use from that interview. Your former commissioner, um, Mr. Gary Griffith. He is a tremendous gentleman. I was telling Pro that this man gave his life to the Lord earlier this year. His son did it last year, and he was so inspired and challenged by the change in his son's life. And the bottom line is that his aunt is Pastor Katian Samaru. She is um, she and his mother are sisters, really. And the bottom line is that she has been a great influence to him over his, over his life for years. As a matter of fact, um, the previous commissioner got a prophetic word concerning his life in the future that really made him think twice as to what he should do with his life at, at this point in time, in this season of his, of his sojourn, so to speak. And as a newborn in Christ, you know, I, I told Pro, I am the one mentoring him. That's a joke because um, at the end of the day, this gentleman loves to hold his head up high and let people know that um, he bows to no one but God. He believes in truth. He loves truth. And for whatever is God's will for his life, he's all for it. He's locked into a prophetic word that he got while he was at Sister Katya and Samaru's um, did I pronounce that name right, Pro? Katya and Samuel, right? Yes, 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 yes. Right, good. That's making sure I'm not um, um, saying the wrong thing. But the bottom line is that um, he's locked into his future right now. That's the point. That's the point. It took a while for him to decide if he should. Go to... Right, there's one more clip I want to play, but I need to locate it properly. No, um, Mr. Gary Griffith, he is a tremendous gentleman. I was... No, that's not... It's one that is, <laughs> I may have to, may have to pause for a little bit to find this thing, yes? Because it, I, I need you all to hear this, to hear what is said Gary, here. Gary, do you, do you? No, not that. You have a nice way of saying things like this, yeah? No, not that one. It might be this last one. That is two minutes and 30 seconds long. So let's Your former commissioner, um, Mr. Gary Griffith. He is a tremendous gentleman. I was telling Pro that this man gave his life to the Lord earlier this year. No, that's his son not did it. it. Yes, 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 yes. Right, good. That's making sure I'm not um, um, saying the wrong thing. But the bottom line is that um, he's locked into his future right now. That's the point. That's the point. 
it took a while for him to decide if he should go this direction or not as far as um, um, making his life the life that God wants it to be. And that's the only way I could describe it, bro. Meaning that um, I've been around him while he was still commissioner and after he was commissioner to encourage him in the Lord. Um, right. So that was one of the important bits there where he says, I was around him while he was commissioner and after he became commissioner. While he was still commissioner and after he was commissioner to encourage him in the Lord, um, knowing when he actually got baptized as well. But to deal with a Christian perspective of nation building is a challenge I know for the Christian community because we as the church generally, as you very well know, we do like politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I could dare say, we don't like politicians either. Pro, you know me too, my, my plain talking, eh? so <laughs> expect plenty of that. Um, now there's another part, another, another bit of the interview where the pastor talks about the need for a Christian with a military background to lead a country. That's the bit I was looking for and was in fact, and I'm not Christian finding. Christian shouldn't get in involved in politics at all, boy. How is it that you so I'm, want I'm to bring this, this together? Pastor Brown, talk to me. Okay, you're muted, huh? so all right, okay. Okay, so we're off now. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I'm a firm believer in the scriptures. I love the word. I love the fact that a lot of what is prophesied in the Old Testament that is to be fulfilled in the new is really before us right now. It's really in our face. And one of the things I could tell you, um, and once um, Pastor Margaret Lee, am I correct now? Yeah, is on the air. She'll, she'll verify, and you being a doctor in theology, you know that in Acts 15, it talks about God building the tabernacle of David and rebuilding it as it was in the days of old to confirm the fact that there's going to be a governmental structure in the earth where Gentiles reign and rule with the same kind of a grace and authority and wisdom that David had. And not simply to reign and rule, but to ensure that what God does with the church just before the rapture is that the church goes out not limping but with a bang in other words we are really going to be the head and not the tail now that is going to happen that is not going to happen in every nation mainly because god respects our will professor mm -hmm. and some people will choose to want to honor god by giving themselves to god to fulfill certain things and some wouldn't do it and god will work with that right So imagine we have a situation where this gentleman is working in the SSE and other workers and employees in the SSE are also members of the church that he has, right? My understanding is that what occurred at the SSE is that members of the church were recruited and hired to work in the SSE, not the other way around. Because the way in which the story has been told by mainstream media, it was to give the impression that SSE members joined the church. It happened the other way around. SSA members, people who are working in the, in, in the SSA, currently working, were recruited from the church. Now the SSA is, I think, maybe about 300 employees in size currently, right? Give or take. So a couple hundred employees. They don't all function out of the same office. The different people work in different sections. And so Major Best, who was a pastor at this church, was hiring people from the church 
and placing them in positions at the SSE. And some of the persons would have been put in positions that dealt with intelligence, interception of intelligence, and analysis of intelligence. Now I want to shift to some of what the Prime Minister had to say recently in his um, press conference, right? Right, switch a topic, okay? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you, got, you were asked two very uh, pointed questions at the conversations with the Prime Minister yesterday on the SSA. One was flat out, is there a police or SSA hit squad? And your response to that was that there's sufficient information to convince us that some public officials who have had access to government equipment and firearms may have been involved in criminal conduct. And then we saw a story today that they, this hit squad may have been responsible for even more than just the one uh, murder that's been reported. How accurate, as much as you can say, how accurate is that reporting? And how much does that really worry you? I read the report and I thought how easy it is to have one thing flow into another. That, that report spoke about a number of things. I'm not in a position to verify what is in that report. But what I, what I can say is that serious concerns emerged in some of our um, security operations very serious investigations are underway. Very decisive actions are being taken based on the gathering of information and, I dare say, evidence as we go along. Those investigations are far from complete, and I would not want to prejudice any of them as we go along. As you know, matters of national security one has to be particularly careful how you expose them or comment upon them or pontificate or even create expansive theories that this might be so. I see, I must say, there's one thing I can say because I was approached by the media when a parallel situation emerged about, was it the research and analytical, right? And it was, it was easy to, easy somebody has fed to the media that there's this RAU in the police service, which is very much a parallel to the, S to the, to the SSA. And therefore, there is interception taking place by the police, which could mirror the difficulties we're having with the SSA. I want to say here, as chairman of the National Security Council, the police does not have equipment to do the interception that the SSA is supposed to do. The police relies on the SSA to do interceptions, gather information, and if criminal activity is identified and the police should be interested in what the SSA has found, the SSA shares that with the police. So the, so, so the, assumption, the assumption that there's an SSA equivalent in the police service doing interceptions and reporting to the Prime Minister and the Minister of National Security, that is not correct. That is simply an extension of a theory that anybody could make without any evidence to support it. You say this RAU unit and research, research and, and, and analysis. Let me give you an example. Not, let me give let me give you police does not have the capacity that the SSA, SSA, SSA has. Let me give you an example. And I'm simply I'm going here now a little ahead of what you know. Some time ago, the police wanted that capacity because they believe it would have been useful to track criminal conduct and organized crime. The policy of this government was not to give that capacity to the police. The parliament allowed for certain interceptions to take place under the head of the police service. 
the head of the um, defense force, and the SSC. Those three departments' heads could have asked for interceptions. That was a parliamentary intervention. So the police, wanting to have certain equipment, did not get that approval from the National Security Council. We found out later on that unbeknownst to the National Security Council, the Commissioner of Police went and sought to procure the equipment. The government took that very seriously. And the government instructed that the equipment be removed from the police and be placed with the SSA. That was done. I tell you this so you can understand the government's policy with respect to the police doing interception. When the police even attempted to do it by procuring without authority the equipment that could do that. And the government intervened and prevented the police from having that equipment. That is why I could tell you now that the police does not have that equipment. But I went further and I told you that the police tried to do that and the policy was maintained by the equipment being removed from the police to the SSA. So the SSA has that equipment. The police got that by a commissioner who thought that they didn't have to follow the policy of the government on this matter. Okay, there are a couple of things that I need to pull together here. So we have the director of an SSE, of the SSE, who is the pastor, who is a pastor, sorry, in a church. We have that director hiring people from the church to work inside the SSE, in different parts of the SSE. You have an SSE that was not constitutionally allowed to carry guns to use guns and firearms using guns before they were allowed to do so because the legislation the firearms legislation was only amended in november of 2023 last year to allow both um prisons officers and employees of the ssa to be able to carry guns but you had members of the ssa using guns from before that we also find out that the SSA would have been sending members of its staff for very advanced training and very advanced weapons training. Because I'm told that there is at least one member of the SSA currently who was trained um, with sniper rifles, right? So there's a member of the SSA who, know, who is a trained sniper. Now the SSA is supposed to be gathering intelligence and doing analysis of said intelligence and then feeding that information to the TTPS for crime fighting. You have the Prime Minister now pointing out to you that the SSE has been acting and functioning in ways that it ought not to have been acting and functioning. And then you are also hearing that the TTPS under a previous commissioner, well, I could say it's under Gary Griffith, when he was commissioner, would have purchased equipment for the purpose of intercepting information without any approval from um, the line ministry or the cabinet. And so that equipment had to be removed from the TTPS and given over to the SSA. Now here's what I'm looking at. There's a clear connection between the head of the SSE and the former commissioner of police. Apart from the fact that they both from, you know, they both have a national security background because they both come from the army. I believe Gary is a little bit more senior than Major Best, but the both of them would have been in the army and would have served in the army and served the country in the army. They then both go on to careers in national security and intelligence in different ways. Gary is a member of the church based on 
the interview here because he doesn't deny it when the pastor talks about him being a member of the church and being baptized in the church he does not deny it in that interview um roger best major roger best is a member of the church as well a pastor in the church so now i have questions were they collaborating as ssa ssa head and commissioner police as part of the dynamic between them as members of the church and then as heads of their various their various um national security arms that's a question for me now with respect to the killings and i have to deal with this very very um gently and gingerly because it's an active investigation based on the information as in the public domain stories by mark bassant um specifically and stories by asha javid so asha javid co covered it mark bassant co covered it as well they both talk about the ssa being linked to at least three murders mark bassant has a story a recent story that talks about the ssa possibly being linked to nine other murders when you start looking at the various links taking place here the fact that you have this church this church apparently seems to have as members of his congregation a former commissioner of police it also has based on newspaper reports um members of the ssa and the di the former director of the ssa you begin to wonder well what why is this church like a hot <laughs> no such a hot spot for people from national security why are they all part and parcel of this church why are they there as the members so i'm looking looking on at that i'm looking on at the connections i'm looking on the fact that okay all right they from you know they have an army background only to find out from friends and from sources that they are members of the coast guard and members of the air guard that are also linked to this church so it appears as if all arms of our defense force army coast guard air guard and at least two other institutions that are linked to national security ssa and the ttps all have a connection with this church i am not going to extrapolate any further all you're bright and all you have sense the next and final question that i want to raise if the ssa is linked to and tied to murders right more than one murder and the government has made it clear that it is not us who at any point in time requested that anything like this happen or take place we didn't even want them to have guns we only approved them having guns in november of 2023 who were they functioning if they were functioning as a kill squad if they are responsible for the murders that we're seeing um in the stories who were they acting on behalf of is it decisions that they were taking amongst themselves is it that they were being asked to do some of the, the the to do to to do the assassinations who exactly are they answering to and that for me is where things get very sticky and very frightening because you have well, at least one one entity that's responsible for intercepting information collecting information analyzing information then you have members who are involved in other aspects of our defense force here who are they answering to was the chain of command here because you see i'm at the point where while i'm willing to be patient i think the country needs a proper breakdown of what exactly went on or was going on i'm not saying that people need to get 
all the details, all the gory details, but certainly we need to understand the nature of the threat. I don't want this to be like 2011 where we just hear it have a threat and the country went into a state of emergency. I think we need to be clear about what exactly was taking place so that we can be more aware and more mindful. Because you see this business of talking about this our country as if it is a theocracy, as if it's a religious state, and then in the next breath, we're hearing about kill squads, and we're hearing so many aspects of national security being involved with a religious organization. I tell you earlier, if it was something that was linked to Islam, everybody would be up in arms now. We would all understand why we need to be concerned about this. But here you have a group of people who think somehow they are designated by God and ordained by God to carry out some kind of political movement and action in the country. And we just supposed to kind of wait to hear? Mm -mm. No. There's too much going on here that is unsettling for me. Murders, people deciding that they're going to assassinate people. Who are they assassinating people for? On behalf of whom? And then when you start seeing the range of connections and how people are connected, more questions are raised. So, Mr. Daniel, who would have been assassinated, I don't think that the assassination was for something as salacious and tawdry as an affair. I think the assassination was linked to the fact that he was intercepting information and he probably had information that could link people to things that they ought not to be doing. And so that, assass that assassination was meant to shut him up. The other assassinations are not clear on. And then Based on the Mark Bassan story, um, and I have to em emphasize the Mark Bassan story, because only know me, I have question marks, that indicate and imply that there might be as many as nine assassinations. If that is the case, if it turns out that that is the case, then you have to ask, who were they taking instructions from? How were they de determining and deciding their targets? And these are some of the pressing questions that I have. And the link between a religious organization and various aspects of national security, I have real concerns where that goes. Now, in the press conference, a number of journalists raise questions about Fitzgerald Hines, Fitzgerald Hines and Hines's suitability for the position. And the prime minister attempted to brush that aside and push it aside. I don't think you can continue to do that, Dr. Rowley. I think you have to come to terms with the fact that Minister Hines may need to be replaced. Not just because of this incident, but for me, this incident brings a number of things to head. I think that there are a lot of other issues and a lot of other things that have taken place and we kind of look on and we kind of like, oh, we ain't comfortable, we ain't. but this, this makes me feel incredibly uncomfortable on top of everything else. So now I want to get back to where I started. At the start of this, I said, we can only tackle crime, right? Our crime fighting initiatives can only be as effective as our intelligence gathering. If our intelligence gathering is compromised here and tainted, do you think we can actually tackle crime? So when you see in those headlines and when you gain that information shared back and forth, I want you to remember that if intelligence gathering is compromised, the ability to fight crime is greatly reduced. 
And this SSA incident doesn't just have implications for us nationally, it has implications for us regionally and internationally, because it means that all of our partners with whom we would have been sharing information with, whether it is the United States, the United Kingdom, Europe, Germany, whichever other countries, because there are a range of countries we partner with. If the SSA is compromised, it means that our ability to share information and receive information about organized crime is compromised. And if we can't get valid information and valid data about crime and organized crime, then we can't fight crime locally. And that is why this entire issue is incredibly important. Okay? All right, folks, this is where I wrap it up. The video will be on, it'll be on YouTube because I'm deactivating my pages again, right? I'm going back into hibernation. I need to continue my break, but it was nice. It was lovely. It was great, 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 great hanging out with you all and seeing you all again. Take care. Bye. I'm gonna try for try for test me. You want to test the rocket launcher? Well, let me tell you something. You're the original butcher. We have the chopper. Lord of mercy. Hear this. Wait, the man. Who that I call?